Zoom number. Okay. I'll give some indication up there. <laughs> okay. All right. Good morning. I'll call this meeting of the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees to order and welcome everyone here. We appreciate your interest in the Alabama Community College System. There's been a lot of work that's gone into this meeting, a lot of calls, committee meetings, etc. I appreciate the Chancellor and his staff and the Community College presidents for providing us and, and helping us be prepared for this meeting. As always, we remain laser focused on student success and remain true to our core mission of education, workforce development, and academic transfer. At this time, we're going to have our invocation. It's by Pastor Paul Gordine, Gordine Engaged Christian Church, Montgomery, Alabama. And Reverend Gordine is originally from Charleston, South Carolina. He has managed to inspire people, young and old, from all walks of life as he uses his God-given abilities to teach, motivate, and spiritually uplift people of all ages. He's described as charismatic, dependable, passionate, articulate, family-oriented, inspiring, and a steadfast leader by those around him. Pastor Gordine has been actively involved in the ministry for over 18 years. He is the pastor and founder of Engaged Christian Church located on McGee Road in Montgomery. And, and, and married to an Auburn gal who's with him here today. So welcome, Pastor Gordine. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, please bow your heads with me. God, we thank you. Thank you for this moment in time you chose to pause us. Thank you for bringing your sons and daughters from all walks of life, from all activities in life, to pause and be centered on honoring you as you empower them to care for those entrusted into their care. We ask, oh God, that you smile on the board, that you smile on presidents, that you smile on all of those who are here that help make education possible for community colleges. We thank you in advance, oh God, that you'll continue, oh God, to draw resources from the north, the south, the east, and the west, that you'll allow relationships forged over years to yield the fruit that's needed so that those who are seeking education to better their lives while bettering the cities they live in, while bettering the state that we're in, might have an opportunity that's affordable. We thank you in advance, oh God, that you'll give presidents of colleges the wisdom and understanding necessary to make God-led decisions that empower the growth of student bodies. We thank you that you'll give this board, oh God, the information, the insight that's necessary, oh God, to galvanize a group together so that as a state we grow. We ask, oh God, that you smile on those individually who's lent their time to service to others and you care for the things that matter to them most. Smile on their families who've lent them, oh God, to lead. God, smile, oh God, on the current board chair who's not here, Father. God, we ask that you would touch his mother right now, that you would put your hands on the hands of the doctors and nurses who are placing their hands on your child, that you would give them the wisdom and insight necessary to understand the body that you have created so that your healing where eyes can't see and hands can't reach might take place. 
that she might be strengthened to walk, to live, and to love. And we ask, oh God, finally, as this board gathers together, as they share their ideas, as they leverage their contacts, as they lend their resources, God, that you might smile by putting a stamp of approval on everything that needs to be done expeditiously so that there'll be no hiccups, hangups, or stops that prevent, oh God, or, or stop the forward progress that you've already laid out to take place. Thank you for including us as, as active members in your plan that you've already set forth before the earth was formed and before, before the forms were, were, were shaped. We ask, oh God, finally, that as they leave, that you might post your angels around them, that you might allow them to make it safely to their destinations with fire that they might light on the things that they're responsible for so that it might move as a frenzy never seen before so that success in their hands might take place through your doing. It's in the mighty, matchless, awesome, magnificent name of the one who was, the one who is, and the one who's sure to come, our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gordine and Miss Gordine, for being here with us. Please stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Jamshell? Present. Mr. John Mitchell? Present. Mr. Present. Mr. Present. Mr. Present. 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 Okay, thank you. Right. You have our agenda that was presented before you. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. 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 Mr. Vice Chairman, I make a motion that today's meeting agenda be amended to include a proposed resolution honoring the life and contributions of former Board of Trustees member, Mr. Frank Caldwell. Have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Shell. Any discussion? All those in favor of our approved amendment, please raise your hand or voice vote. The amendment passes. Have the, you have the board minutes that were sent out ahead of time. Is there approval of minutes from our March 13th meeting? So moved. Second. Okay. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Motion was Mr. Shell. Second was Mr. Mitchell. All in favor, say aye. aye. Motion passes. Do we have anyone signed up for public comment? We have no college spotlight this time, so we'll move into our executive legal and public information action items, section 8A1. <clears throat> this is Drake State Community College Technical College Bookstore Operation Agreement. It is recommended that the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize the president of Drake State Community College and Technical College, Drake State, to enter into a bookstore operation service agreement with Barnes & Noble College Booksellers, LLC. For the beginning period, June 1st, 2024, and ending on June 30th, 2029, with an option for an additional five one-year renewals and to charge a $26 per credit hour fee for textbook rental. Do we have a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. I'll second. Mr. Wong, Mr. Second. Mr. McCartney, second. All those in favor, or any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, raise your hand or voice vote. Motion carries. Okay. Item 8A2, Gaston State Community College. <clears throat> It is recommended that the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize Gadsden State Community College to increase the building fee, special building fee, from $12 to $20 per credit hour. The fee, fee will take a place, take effect, fall semester of 2024. It is expected to bring in 600000 additional revenue. 
Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a motion? Mr. Second. McCartney, Jeb Shell, second. All those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Motion carries. All right, item three. <clears throat> it is recommended the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize guests and take community college to transition from a refundable dorm deposit of $200 to a non refundable application fee of $100 fall spring or fifty dollars for summer do we have a motion so move so move second second miss gray any discussion all those in favor raise your raise your hand or voice vote motion carries Okay, item four is recommend the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize the president of Wallace State Community College to expend eight hundred ten thousand dollars to purchase training equipment for the college's mechatronics and robotic welding programs. Do we have a motion? So moved, so move, Mr. Shell. Second. Second. Second, Mr. Houston. All those in favor, raise your right hand or voice vote. Uh, okay. Motion carries. Item five. Okay, this is a a proclamation, Alabama Community College System proclamation by the Alabama Community College System Board of Directors. It's a whole lot of whereas, and I'm gonna read a couple of them. So, uh, by the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees, whereas community colleges serve as catalysts for economic development by preparing a skilled workforce to meet the demands of emerging industries and contributing to the overall prosperity of the United States and whereas the Alabama Community College System today represents 24 community and technical colleges with over 130 locations across Alabama within every region, as well as Alabama Adult Ed, the ACCS Innovation Center, Alabama Technology Network, and private school licensure under the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees and the leadership of Chancellor Jimmy H. Baker. And whereas the mission of the Alabama Community College System is to provide a unified system of institutions dedicated to ex excellence in delivering academic education, adult ed, and workforce development. And whereas Alabama's community co and technical colleges provide world-class, accessible, affordable education and training for family sustaining and life-fulfilling careers that are pivotal to the infrastructure of Alabama's quality of life, including the training of citizens in careers in healthcare, transportation, education, construction, hospitality, and several other skilled trades. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for the Alabama Community College System hereby proclaims the month of April as Community College Month in the state of Alabama. We commend the invaluable contributions of community colleges in transforming lives, building futures, and enriching communities across Alabama. We encourage all citizens to join us in acknowledging the profound impact of our community colleges on education, workforce development, and the overall well-being of our society. Adopted by the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees this 10th day of April, 2024. Move to approve as presented. Okay, do I have a second? Second. <clears throat> second from Mr. Leitze. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by raising your hand or voice vote. Motion carries. Okay, item number six, this is uh, the one we just amended our agenda for, is a re resolution <coughs> honoring the life and contributions of Mr. Frank Caldwell. And I'm going to read this resolution now. Whereas Mr. James Frank Caldwell was born on April 29th, 1938, and whereas Mr. Caldwell was born in Birmingham, Alabama, but spent a majority of his adult life as a resident of Jasper, Alabama, and whereas Mr. Caldwell served 41 years of his professional career in the nursing home industry, he was president of Ridgewood Healthcare Center in Jasper and co-owner of Ridgeview Nursing Home in Jasper and Marshall Manor Nursing Home in Gunnersville. And whereas Mr. Caldwell has been recognized for his positive contributions in the nursing home industry, serving as a past president of the Alabama Nursing Home Association and named State Administrator of the Year in 1990, and whereas Mr. Caldwell also served on other notable state and local boards and committees, serving as a member of the Alabama State Republican Executive Committee, 
the Jasper Housing Authority, and the Jasper Planning and Zoning Board. Mr. Caldwell was also a member of Jasper's First Baptist Church and the Jasper Kiwanis Club for many years. And whereas Mr. Caldwell was appointed by Governor Robert Bentley on May 5th, 2015, and confirmed by the Alabama Senate on May 7th, 2015, to serve as the Congressional District 4 representative on the inaugural Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees. And whereas Mr. Caldwell served on the ACCS Board of Trustees with distinction from May 2015 through January 2017, he served on the board's finance and adult and audit committee during that time and was instrumental in the committee's early work to move forward a uniform enterprise resource planning system for all the community and technical college within the ACCS. And whereas Mr. Caldwell was a leader in his community, a loving father and grandfather to his family, and a lifelong supporter of the Alabama Community College System. Now, therefore, we, the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees, hereby express our sincerest condolences and sympathy for Mr. Caldwell's death and appreciation for his past service as one of the initial members of the ACCS Board of Trustees. Mr. Caldwell's service helped shape the foundation of leadership for Alabama Community and Technical Colleges to where we are today. Furthermore, we offer this resolution to his family in tribute of his life and positive contributions to the Alabama Community College System. Adopted by the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees this 10th day of April, 2024. Do I have a motion? Mr. Vice Chairman, I make the motion to accept the resolution as presented. Okay, Mr. Light says the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Houston. Any discussion? I would like to make some comments. Uh, I would like to personally thank Mr. Caldwell for his dedication and contributions to this board. Being one of the first trustees, he helped set the course of the board and is a big part of the successes we experience today. Uh, former trustee and representative Matt Woods of Jasper, Walker County, uh, wanted to be here today, but he had a conflict. Uh, he wanted me to share his appreciation of this resolution in honor of Mr. Caldwell. He stated he was a wonderful mentor to him and will be greatly missed in his community. Please remember Mr. Caldwell's family in your thoughts and prayers. May we not forget his service to the Alabama Community College System. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lightsey. Any other comments? Is there a motion to approve the, this resolution? Second. Okay, you are in second. All right. Okay, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Or see. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. We now move to uh, Section 9, Instruction, Research and Development, Adult Education Facilities, Physical Information Technology, and Workforce Development Action Items. First is Action Item A1, Calhoun Community College. This is main campus HVAC equipment improvements at the Aerospace Training Center, Center for Applied Technology, Noble, Russell, and Harris Hall. It is recommended the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize Calhoun Community College to proceed with construction of the project named to main campus HVAC equipment improvements at Aerospace Training Center, Center for Applied Technology, Noble Russell, and Harris Hall. Construction contracts shall be executed no later than June 30th, 2024, or this authorization shall expire. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor of that, raise your hand or signify by voice vote. Motion carries. <clears throat> Item two is that Reed State Technical College is recommended that the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize Reed State Technical College to proceed with the name Building 600 Cosmetology Renovation. The renovation includes improvements to the existing building interior and exterior. Construction contracts shall be executed no later than May 31st, 2024 or this authorization, authorization shall expire. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Lightsey have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand or voice vote. Motion uh -huh. carries. Motion carries. Okay, item three, at Wallace State Community College is recommend the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize Wallace State Community College to proceed with the construction of the project named Hansville Campus Paving Improvements. 
construction contract shall be executed no later than June 1st, 2024, or this authorization, authorization shall expire. Is there a motion? To so move. Move. Second. Good motion. Second by Mr. Shell. Any discussion? Hey. All those in favor, raise your hand or voice vote. The motion carries. All right. Okay, item four is Enterprise, Enterprise State Community College. It is recommended the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees authorize Enterprise State Community College to proceed with construction of the project named Enterprise Campus Mechanical and Electrical Improvements. Construction contracts shall be executed no later than June 30th, 2024, or this authorization shall expire. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mr. Mitchell, second. Second. Mr. Shell, any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand or voice vote. Motion carries. Okay, the, the last item under this category is item five at Jefferson State Community College. Exterior improvements of Bethune, DeRamus Hall, and George Layton Building. It is recommended the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees approve change order number four civil bid package for the project named Jefferson State Community College Exterior Improvements of Bethune, DeRamus Hall, and George Layton Building. Is there a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. So moved, Mr. Houston's motion. Second. Second, Mr. Chell. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand or voice vote. Motion carries. Now, uh, Section 10, Personnel. Ms. Finkelstein. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Charlene Finkelstein with Human Resources, and as usual, I'm here to introduce some new hires that were added to our staff. Uh, I have a very special group to introduce to you today. Uh, earlier this year, we created what was basically a whole new department in our office uh, to cover safety and security issues. And this new department is headed up by Mark Bailey, our Director of Public Safety. And Mark has staffed this department with some of the most top-notch people uh, who are the best in their field. And I am thrilled to be able to introduce some of them to you today. First of all, we have Mr. Ronald Kiker. Ron, would you stand? Ron is our emergency operations specialist, one of them. He has over 40 years of experience in law enforcement and security. A large part of his experience has been in law enforcement training. He served in various positions, including patrol officer, instructor, training director, assistant police chief of the Sneed Police Department, and corporal in the Hansville Police Department. He spent seven years as director of training at the Marshall Space Flight Center, and most recently served as a consultant and an investigator for the Blount County DA's office. He has numerous law enforcement certifications, too many to name, and he is going to be based at Wallace State Hansville. Thank you, Ron. Chris Martin. Chris is also an emergency operations specialist for us. He served over 20 years in the Alabama Army National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserve. He served 15 years in various capacities at the Dadeville Police Department, including Assistant Chief of Police. Most recently, he served as Chief Deputy Marshal for the Supreme Court of Alabama's Marshals Department. He has an associate's and a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and dozens of certifications in law enforcement and the military. He is based at Central Alabama Community College. Thank you. Rodney Parzanis. Rodney has over 20, he, I'm sorry, he's a background investigator for us, and he has over 27 years of experience in law enforcement. He served in various capacities for the Birmingham and Gardendale Police Departments, including patrol officer, field training officer, sergeant, and internal affairs investigator. He's a trained school resource officer and first responder who most recently served as an officer at Jefferson State Community College. He has an associate's degree in law enforcement from Jeff State, and he is based at Jeff State. Thank you, Rodney. Charles Hedry. He's our new polygraph examiner. Charles has over 30 years of law enforcement and investigative experience. He served as an investigator and training officer for the Talladega County Sheriff's Department and as an investigator for the Alabama Department of Agriculture. He served for the last 10 years as acting commander and senior public corruption investigator and senior forensic polygraph examiner for the Alabama Department of Corrections in Springville, Alabama. He has a bachelor's degree in liberal studies from Excelsior College and a Juris Doctorate from the Birmingham School of Law. 
He is based at Central Alabama Community College also. Thank you. Archie Schnuel. Archie is a mental health specialist. He has 37 years of experience in law enforcement and counseling, including eight years with the Alabama DHR. He served as chief investigator and assistant chief of police for the Tallahassee Police Department, as well as a special agent with the State Bureau of Investigation. He's worked as a crisis responder for Veterans Affairs, and he's a certified master addiction uh, counselor. For the last 15 years, he's been a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice and also provides counseling for Bradford Health Services. Archie has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Jacksonville State and a master's in public administration from Auburn University, as well as a master's in marriage and family therapy from Amherst University. Archie's based at Southern Union Community College. Michael Lovelace. Michael is a medical emergency specialist. He has over 32 years of experience in the emergency medical field as a flight nurse, paramedic, clinical coordinator, police officer, and trainer. He served as an instructor for 20 years at the University of Alabama's Department of Emergency Medicine and over 30 years at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office Academy. He also served seven years in the U.S. Navy Reserve as a combat field medic. He has an associate's degree in nursing from Gulf Coast Community College, has numerous licenses as a registered nurse in trauma, transport, emergency, and critical care. And I've been told that there are only 10 people in this entire country that have the certifications that Mr. Lovelace has, and that's pretty impressive to me. Um, he is based at Jefferson State Community College. Thank you. There was one other uh, member of this group that couldn't make it today, so I'll introduce him next time. But um, in the meantime, let's welcome all these fabulous, talented people. To our side. Thank you, Ms. Finkelstein. What a, a great group and great backgrounds and uh, a, lot of, a lot of years of service, a lot of wonderful certifications. We're, we appreciate you guys and glad you're on board. Thank you. At this time, we'll have the Chancellor's report. Uh, call on Neil Scott to give our regular report on attendance, enrollment, and yes, whatever sir. else you want to talk about. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for always giving me an opportunity to give an enrollment update. I'll be brief. Um, and Jim, if you're controlling the slides, this is actually the slides are actually a part of our live the mission session. So uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to get back up in a few minutes as a part of the live the mission series and talk about that. So these slides are not relevant to this. So I'm not going to advance those. Um, but our but our enrollment numbers today. <clears throat> Our spring semester is winding up, um, and we actually do have final spring for credit enrollment numbers to report. So in the spring of 2024, 77,909 students, so almost 78,000 students, took four credit courses at one of Alabama's community or technical colleges. This is a 7.9% increase in headcount over spring 23. 21 of our 24 colleges ended up being ahead in their headcount. Those almost 78,000 students took 652,650 credit hours. That, this is a 5.59% increase in credit hour production spring over spring. Um, and 22 of our 24 colleges were ahead in credit hour production. Always, always happy to celebrate those numbers, particularly when they come in and they are final and we've reported those to the, uh, to the appropriate agencies. But, uh, but we're very excited to be uh, to be almost 8% ahead and a little over 5.5% in headcount and credit hours, respectively. Summer enrollment looks good as well. Um, we, are, we, have, we have students who are already registering for summer courses, and those will begin um, here in just a few short weeks. But, uh, but we didn't have a great comparative date for last year, but, but uh, we can always compare applications. Date to the, or year to date, we're 5.25% ahead in summer applications. Fall enrollment looks good too. We have over 46,000 fall applications for enrollment, and that is 10.62% more than the applications we had last year. Uh, as of the last board meeting, when we were at Wallace State, I reported to you that our applications are up in some key areas, first time freshman, transfer, and dual enrollment. Um, all of those continue to, to be up. 
Um, so that remains the case this month, but in addition to those key areas, we've also seen an uptick in our readmit slash returning student applications. These are students who were enrolled with us at one time, may not have completed their certificate or their degree, and they either dropped out or stopped out long enough that they had to reapply to enroll with us. So we're really excited to see some of those students who are returning back to us and seeing value in what it is that, uh, that we offer. Uh, so it's encouraging to see those students returning. On the workforce development and adult education side, we finished the fall term with a total of 19,152 registrations for adult, uh, for adult education programs such as adult basic education, GED, and English as a second language. Um, and, we, and we had over 32,000 registrations in workforce development programs such as Skills for Success, ACE, MAPS, uh, continuing ed, training for business and industry, and, uh, and general workforce education. So that, that was fall numbers. So again, uh, that was uh, very encouraging to see, to see those numbers as well. But for this spring, and we try workforce education and adult education don't really follow the same timelines that our four credit education does. We don't break that up into semesters quite like we normally do. But for the purposes of conversations like this, we try to break it down so that it makes sense. Um, but for this spring, so beginning January 1st, we already have 10,975 registrations for these types of programs, for adult education and, uh, and workforce education programs for this spring. So students can register for multiple workforce and adult education programs. Somebody may be in adult education on, on one side, they may be enrolled in a Skills for Success program on the other side. Um, but, uh, and so we have, we look at registrations separately, so somebody may be registered for more than one program, but uh, the unduplicated headcount, so actually breaking that down to individual citizens who are impacted by these programs, uh, total for fall and spring comes out to 26,722, and we still have some time left in the spring to increase that as well. So in addition to the, to the uh, seven, nearly 78,000 who were registered this spring, uh, you know, we're looking, we're looking at around uh, at around another, what did I say, uh, almost 11,000 students who are registered for, co for courses this spring through workforce and adult education. So our impact is much, much larger than just our four credit programs. We don't always talk about those, but when I do have an opportunity to speak, I like to try to include those. If you have questions about those numbers, I encourage you to reach out to Jennifer Hall and Barry May in our workforce development area. Um, and then of course, David Walters on the adult education side. Um, those numbers were supplied to me by them, but I uh, always like to include those in our enrollment report. So are there any questions about enrollment? All right. Well, I'll be back up here in just a few minutes uh, to give a, an, an update on our enrollment marketing efforts. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Russell. Good morning, Chancellor on the board. Uh, my name is Russell Moore. I work here in the communications department at the system office. So as, as Neil referenced, uh, I'm, I'm excited and honored to introduce those who are going to uh, expand a little more about our Live Your Mission series that, that's been ongoing. As you know, community is in our middle name. And what that looks like in each and every, every college truly is based upon <coughs> that particular community and its unique needs. We've presented the Live Your Mission snippets a couple times now, and we're proud that our colleges are harnessing these ideas and strengthening their communities even more with excellent ideas. So over the next few minutes, you'll hear more about these initiatives uh, from three different, three different colleges or groups. So first, you'll hear from Enterprise State and their Educational Opportunity Center. The Educational Opportunity Center at, at Enterprise actively finds and engages students who have dropped out of high school or who have never finished or attended college. The, the EOC doesn't just wait for students to walk through the door. Through offering, through offering equal access, nearly 1,000 lives across a four-county area and the enterprise service area are inspired to just keep going. After that, you'll hear from Lawson State, and you'll hear about its annual career and community resource fair. This event not only reaches out to its community, but it also brings the community through its doors. The resource fair addresses the whole student experience from college to career, including wellness. Partners from across Birmingham commit to sharing their opportunities with Lawson State students. 
And as, as Neil referenced, uh, finally you'll hear from the student success team and their efforts with, with uh, variable marketing. Uh, this, this marketing is showing students across the system that we care enough about them to know their name. Student success continues to harness the strength of our community colleges enrollment, enrollment processes by creating innovative, personalized ways to reach our students, such as through postcards and customized acceptance letters. So at this time, I'll turn it over to President Long. Thank you, Russell. You just stole my introduction. Uh, board members, Chancellor, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce the, the leaders of this program. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're, we're all trying to improve the lives of the members of our community, but one of the hardest reach demographics is are those non-traditional students, those students that have dropped out of high school, those adult students that are looking for a greater opportunity. Um, and, the, and our EOC program is, is really still in its infancy stages, but uh, it is starting to have a, tr a tremendous impact on those individuals that we serve. And it is an honor and a privilege to introduce you to our Dean of Students, Cassie Mathis, and the director of our EOC program, uh, Jennifer Braden, this morning. Good morning. Thank you all for allowing us to be here today. Um, I'm really excited about this program. We actually have three TRIO programs at Enterprise State. Um, the Talent Search program, it works with middle school and high school students. Our SSS program works with college students. And then as Mr. Long mentioned, our EOC program works with adult students. I like to treat all my programs the same. It's just like with kids. You know, you don't have a favorite. You don't want to say you have a favorite, but EOC is one of my favorite programs because in my opinion, it reaches a demographic of students that are often overlooked. Um, we talk about workforce and getting people into the workforce, but the biggest hurdle to getting into the workforce is education and training. And when it comes to adult students, that's that group that most colleges don't have a direct audience with. When you talk about talent search, you have people that go into the high schools, that's a direct audience. When you talk about SSS, that's a college program, that's a direct audience. But with EOC, you have to go out into the community and find these people. And then you have to talk to them and convince them that education is something that they need. And that is a challenging thing. But I am so proud because Jennifer Braden, she's going to come up. She is our EOC director. She has done a phenomenal job with this program in less than three years. Um, she has gone out and she has built those relationships with community agencies. She's built those relation relationships with, I think, with what I think is the hardest demographic to reach, and she's done such a phenomenal job. So I'm going to call Jennifer up to come and talk about some of the details of this really amazing program. Thank you so much. Okay, so what is the Educational Opportunity Center? So we are a federal grant program. Enterprise State decided a few years ago to write for the first time for the EOC grant, which is a TRIO program. So for those of you who aren't familiar with TRIO, TRIO started in 1964-65 with the first three programs, uh, Student Support Services, Educational Talent Search, and Upward Bound. In 1972, they decided that they needed to look for those adults who missed the boat, if you will, with education. They didn't go on to college. They dropped out of high school. So in 1972, EOC was funded as the fourth TRIO program, and we are targeted to serve those adults. So we are looking for primarily low-income and first generation. That's also who TRIO is funded to serve and looks to serve. Um, we serve as a bridge. Our advisors serve as a bridge between the individual and the education system that meets their need, wherever that may be, whether it's adult education, workforce training, or enrolling in credit-bearing classes. So we help them. Where are you at right now, and what services do you need, and how can we connect you to those services? So EOC is forbidden from being a recruiter for any one specific school. So I always love to point this out when I go out to the community, that when a college writes for an EOC program, they truly are serving their community, not just their school. They're working to try and help those individuals to better themselves. We're trying to meet the needs of the student. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and TRIO as a whole does that. We want to help individuals who are underrepresented in higher education to access that system and ultimately create generational change. That's what it's all about. So how do we do that, right? 
So our program is funded to serve 850 students annually. That's a lot, right? And pretty much we are getting brand new 850 people every year. And so we have to do that by going to those local agencies that serve this population that we're looking for. So we started by going to all the different community agencies locally that we could find. We go to housing authorities, we go to um, community service, family service centers, but we also go into the jails. We go to workforce, we go to probation and parole, we go to community work release, um, we go to drug rehabilitation centers. So in fact, you know, I've got our numbers here. So last year, our first full year, 22-23, the, the grant was funded in September of 21. By the time everybody got on board, we were, you know, well into January. So our first year where we really were, had everybody fully on board and going was 22-23. And in that year, we served 856 participants. 81 of those participants were 19 years or older. And 60% of those participants were actually 28 years or older. 94% um, of our participants were low income or first generation, with 67% of them being both low income and first generation. So, um, we go to these different agencies. We work this, and this is just a few, we have almost 50 agencies and college locations that we work with. So we work really closely with adult ed at Enterprise State, at Wallace, at LBW. We work really close with workforce at those different colleges as well, because that's where we're sending our students to get trained. So um, we, we help them complete their, we help them do a variety of things. We help them complete career assessments. We help them with application admissions. We help them with figuring out what high demand careers are locally and how can they get those jobs and those high demand uh, fields. Um, we help them complete their FAFSA which this year has been a lot of fun. So everybody knows that that's going on this year. But we're out there helping them. We sit down right next to them. So we have a video from one of our very first participants that I worked with when this program started. Um, and she can tell you better than I can. My name's Lane Donaldson. I'm a current um, student at ESCC. And I went through the Educational Opportunity Center. Okay, so the thought of going to school again after being out of school for almost 40 years uh, was very scary, very um, nerve-wracking, like anxiety attacks, and um, just not sure if that was actually, actually what I wanted to do. So I definitely know that if I had not met the, my advisor at the EOC department, that I would have not pursued my education as much as I have. It would not have been as easy. It would have, I would probably have wanted to give up. I did not even know the um, documents that I needed for my for my Pell Grant, and she was very helpful in that. She helped me with my schedule. She encouraged me. Now that I've started working towards my degree, I'm so happy that I will be able to help people. I will be able to have the job that I've wanted my whole entire life. I will tell them that they're not too old, and that it's not too late, and that um, you, would, you would love it just to just do it. So as always, students say it better than they can, <laughs> right? They live it and they know it from, from everything they are. They know what these types of programs and what our community colleges do for them. They change their lives. And that's what our advisors, we have office, we'll travel. We go out and we look for these people and we find them. And so I love it when she said, you're not too old and it's not too late. And that's what EOC does every day, is help them realize that, that they're not too old and it's not too late. So, thank you very much, Is any questions? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Thank you, Chancellor Baker, the board. Uh, my name is Dorian Walyoon. I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives and External Relations at Lawson State Community College. I bring you all greetings this morning on behalf of Dr. Cynthia Anthony. Uh, she regrettably couldn't make it this morning, had a personal emergency to attend to. But the way we live our mission, um, and we decided to capture that, um, is through our annual Career and Community Resource Fair. Uh, the annual Community um, Career and Resource Fair is a major event. It's one of our flagship events that we do um, in the community and for our students um, each and every year. 
The mission of Lawson State Community College, of course, is to provide affordable and accessible quality educational opportunities that promote economic growth, enhance the quality of the life of diverse communities we serve through a varied instructional modes and lifelong learning opportunities. The college prepares students for gainful employment, career advancement, college transfer, and workforce <coughs> development. Um, I get the opportunity to speak to parents and students all the time as they onboard here at the college. And I tell um, each and every group the most important thing about attending Lawson State is preparing for law life after Lawson State. And that's really what we're all here to do is to help enrich the communities in which we serve by providing them with awesome opportunities to, to upskill their life, right? And that's what it's really um, about. And we do that with the Community Resource Fair. Um, this year, specifically, each year we look to assess is, is done by a, a community and, and led by our career and college transfer coordinator, Ms. Akila Haley. This year, we really tried to do more as far as engagement goes um, by engaging our community leaders uh, to help sponsor and support this event and bring uh, community participants out. So it's not just an event for our students, our alumni, uh, but definitely it's for the communities we serve. We're one college with two campuses in Birmingham and Bessemer, Alabama. And so this event, to bring those community leaders, really helps us to really capture that engagement that we really want. So you see the co-sponsors there, Representative Patrick Sellers, uh, Representative Art Arterio Tillman, and Representative Travis Hendricks. Uh, we do it at our Bessemer Civic Center um, every year. And I think this is a video. Um, let's see if it plays. Uh, but that's Ms. Akila Haley. She did have a chance to go on the news and to promote this event and promote this activity um, to uh, the community of Birmingham and the community of Bessemer. Um, this took a, a, a mighty act on her part, and we're very proud of the work she's done to, to work on this event and to promote this event. Um, in the community. <coughs> These are some of the pictures um, from the fair. Um, you can see all the different engagement. We also, it has a health and resource component. So it's not just career services. Um, we turned it into community resource fair. We know many of our students and many of the communities we serve deal with services that they need, such as uh, access to health care, uh, getting your blood pressure taken. So we also engage our nursing department. Um, our nursing students come over um, and they do health, health, with health screenings uh, for those participants that come as well. Uh, this is just a, a, a overhead look of how big this event is um, that we host at the Bessemer Civic Center. You can see um, the setup there. These are some of our, our staff, and you see uh, some of our instructors who also participate. So our instructors bring um, their students over, especially those that are getting ready to graduate. We want them to come over and connect with employers and give them opportunities to go ahead and prepare for life after Lawson. Daniel, just some stats on the, on the fair. So outreach opportunities, um, it provides insights and information to various career opportunities, educational pathways. Uh, enhances the quality of life by including resources related to health, wellness, and social support. Some information about this year's event. Uh, we had 62 uh, vendors, employers, and community partners to participate, and we engaged over 500 students. Over 500 people attended this fair this year, and that is an uptick. Uh, when I first came to Lawson State, this was my baby. This is what I, I used to have to work on. So Ms. Haley has done an exceptional job continuing to scale up this event every year by, and connecting with 500 different people. Even furthermore, in 2023, uh, we had the opportunity to host the Governor's Job Fair for people with disabilities. This speaks again to our, um, our mission, to live our mission, and to engage the community in a different way. And so this is just some, some pictures from that event that we had um, in our gymnasium on campus. You can see the impact that we had there. These are some of the flyers that we put out to help support this event. Um, it, was hap it did happen in October. Uh, it was a major event on campus. Again, in 2023, we partnered again and had another community job fair, uh, Patrick, Pat, uh, partnering with Patrick Sellers uh, to have another community job fair uh, we did in our Academic Success Center. And so one thing that we understand is that education is truly important. The skills are truly important. But if it does not help you equate to a better life and a quality of life, after you leave our doors, then we've missed the mark. And so we're looking and we consistently look for those opportunities to connect with our community um, and provide these opportunities for our students. Um, just to summarize it, uh, we want to provide accessible education for all our students. 
Uh, we want to drive economic growth. We want to enhance the quality of life of the students and the community in which we serve. Dr. Anthony is a huge component of stewardship, um, and stewardship equates to service for us. Um, adapting to community needs, that means we consistently assess what we're doing and what we're providing and ensuring that it is effective and impactful. Um, and then fostering social impact and equity. That ensures, through these events, we're ensuring that everybody has a seat at the table and has access to opportunities. Well, thanks for hosting me here at Lawson State. And uh, thanks, Congresswoman, for encouraging me to visit. I see why you did. There's a lot to be proud of here. And it's so important right now because uh, under President Biden's leadership, uh, we are entering an unprecedented period of building new infrastructure, creating new kinds of manufacturing jobs, the kinds of training that I saw here, preparing young people to thrive in fields from uh, automotive maintenance to robotics and manufacturing to commercial driving. We need those skills. We need to build them up like never before. And of course, we're not just building up the country. We're, we're building livelihoods here. And yeah. I'm glad I got to see that for myself. And not to pat ourselves on the back, but just to say that we, we believe we're doing a good job in those areas um, because we had the Secretary of Transportation <clears throat> visit, our, visit our campus to see the things that we're doing to help impact the economic growth and development of students in the communities that we serve. Um, this is a statement from Dr. Anthony. Together we can build stronger communities and create opportunities that positively impact the lives of generations to come. And that's how we live our mission at Lawson State Community College, and we're proud to do that and proud to serve um, in the Alabama Community College system. Thank you. All right, good to see everyone again. So I'm really thrilled to be able to be a part of the Live the Mission series because I normally stand up here and talk to you about numbers. Um, and numbers, uh, numbers sometimes don't really speak to the mission and what's being accomplished. Um, but this is a really exciting venture for our office um, and, for, and for this building because one of the things that, uh, as I talk to Ebony a lot, we talk a lot about marketing our system and helping people understand what is happening across the state and within, and within the community college system. But one thing that we, that we rarely get an opportunity to do is really, is really tout exactly what's happening individually at our colleges. And so Ebony and I agree on one fundamental thing, and that is that college enrollment or college marketing does not equal enrollment marketing. And if you've ever been on a college campus, you know what I'm talking about here. You have a, you have a marketing department that is really, really trying to tout all of the big things that are happening there at the college. They're trying to talk about overall services and exciting events, and they're trying to get people uh, to really buy into the overall mission of the college. But you also have this audience of, of prospective students who need to be marketed to in a very specific way. Those event invitations and those, uh, and those Facebook and Instagram posts and things like that, they, they certainly supplement the enrollment efforts, but they do not necessarily lead a student toward taking whatever that next appropriate step is in the enrollment journey. And so enrollment marketing and college marketing are two different beasts altogether, but they do complement each other. So one of the things that, uh, one of the things that back when Olivier Charles was still here before he took the reins at Bishop State, this is something that he and I talked a lot about. Only a handful of our colleges were purchasing names to be able to market to them. Most of our colleges were going out to, uh, to college fairs, they were going out to school visits, church visits, they were doing a lot of different things to be able to, to get students interested in coming to their college. But, one, but a staple of sound enrollment management practices is to purchase names from sources like ACT or SAT, and there, and there are several others, but ACT is one of the most reputable ones. Uh, and so in October of 2023, our system office partnered with, uh, partnered with a company to be able to purchase names and contact information of all of the ACT takers for, from our state. And so we purchased both 2024 graduate names and 2025 graduation year names. Alabama public high school students are required to take the ACT in their junior year, so this allowed us to be able to capture nearly all of the students across, across our state. Uh, we still would like to do a little bit of work on make sure, making sure that we're capturing public school students and homeschool students, uh, but, 
but having all the names and contact information of all the public high school students is a, is a really nice start. So having access to these, con to these names and contact information allows us to be able to market on behalf of our colleges and to, and to market relevant enrollment, manage or enrollment information to students earlier in the enrollment cycle. And as I said, only a few of our colleges were purchasing these names, and so this actually represented a savings for our colleges because now the system office was able to purchase these and the colleges who were doing that didn't have to do that anymore. So we have the names, though. Now what? So we, we worked with our colleges. Uh, well, we needed a way to be able to market <coughs> our colleges to these students. It doesn't do us a lot of good to be able to market ACCS. I could send a brochure out to a high school student that has ACCS's logo and our mission on it, but that wouldn't mean much to a high school student and to their parents. They want to know, how does this relate to me? What, what action can I take? So we wanted to be able to market out to our colleges, but we had a few, we had a few things that we wanted to consider. One is the very unique identity of our 24 colleges. They have different brands, they have different logos, different color schemes, different fonts that they, that they like to put on their print pieces. Another issue is that our students live in, uh, in different service areas. And some of those service areas are served by more than one college. You think about a student who lives in Jefferson County, do we market Lawson State or do we market Jefferson State? And I'll tell you in a moment about how we, how we handled that, uh, that dilemma. We also wanted to be able to connect the data. This was important. We wanted, through this effort, to be able to, to encourage students to apply for admission to our college. But we didn't want to market out to people who had already applied for admission, right? And, and we also wanted to be able to stop this marketing once a student applied for admission. So we had to find a data connection to be able to uh, it let systems know, uh, let certain systems know when a, uh, when a student has applied so that the marketing can stop. And there were plenty of other issues, but I wanted to, uh, wanted to highlight a few of those. So what we did is we actually partnered with a company that, uh, that specializes in a few different things, and one of those is variable print. On your way in, if you're a president, you should have gotten um, a sample of the information that is going out on behalf of your colleges, board members, Chancellor Baker. You have in front of you a handful of samples, hopefully, of the colleges that, uh, that you have a special interest in. But what you're seeing there is an example of variable print. You have a template. Um, the postcard there is a templated postcard that just says, it says discover uh, there. Uh, and I'll, I'll show a sample on the screen here in just a moment. But that, that's a template. The colors, the logos, the typefaces are different depending on what the college is supplied to us. On the back, there's an image that the college supplied to us. So it's following the same basic template but it is variable based off of where the student lives and what, uh, and what a student has, uh, and, and it can be variable to what a student has expressed interest in. So the company that we partnered with per, uh, specializes in variable print. They also, their data structure made it incredibly easy for us to be able to connect those two systems as I was talking about and be able to say, hey, a student has now applied for admission. They need to stop getting information encouraging them to apply for admission. And then the customizable nature of that print, um, it, print and email and text. And I'm going to show you some examples of some of those things here in just a moment. And then there's a, a personal URL that students are driven to where they have the opportunity to find out more information and, and have direct access to, a, to the college in which they are interested to their application for admission and, uh, and academic pages. So through this, we built two separate campaigns. If you're in enrollment management, you can think of these, these campaigns as a prospect campaign and an inquiry campaign. And I'll just give you a very quick definition. A prospect is a name that you buy. It is, it, is a somewhat, it is a student who has not necessarily indicated an interest. They've certainly not applied for admission yet. They've just bought, you have just bought their name. An inquiry is a student who has raised their hand and said, I'm interested in one or more of, of the colleges that you're, that you're trying to talk to me about. So for the prospect, uh, for the prospect uh, campaign, I'm going to skip ahead. Prospect campaign, students receive the postcard that you're seeing. It's a pretty good sized postcard. Uh, we, we sent out uh, uh, somewhere around uh, 25,000 of those after we, dis after we discovered who had and had not applied to our colleges and who had, had inquired to our colleges. But around 25,000 of those got sent out just a few weeks ago. 
that QR code leads them back to their personalized landing page where a student can inquire, give us more information about themselves, and uh, indicate a college that they'd like to hear more. Uh, hopefully it's the college that we marketed to, but uh, as we discussed earlier, somebody may be, in a, may be in a service area that's served by more than one college. They're also getting up to 10 emails, uh, depending on when they, when they inquire. If they inquire, they will stop out of this prospect campaign, but that, uh, that email chain is driving them to inquire at one of our colleges and driving them back to that personal landing page. And we also got a survey out to them. So that survey is going to provide us with some pretty good data to find out what students are interested in, uh, how, what, uh, what sort of factors are leading them toward making a decision. So each prospect, each person whose name that we bought got, uh, got this. If you don't have a sample in front of you, Here's, a, here's a, um, a sample of the front and back of the postcard. It dis the front says Discover Real Life Education. It is in the color, the typeface, and it has the logo of the college for whom we sent that, uh, for whom we sent that out. The back, again, is a, is a template, but says mostly the same thing. But, uh, but we did rely on the colleges to supply us with the images that, uh, that you see. This one uh, is just another slide with more of the same information. We are really, really proud of the way that these postcards turned out. And I think that as those are hitting mailboxes, students are really seeing this and thinking about, uh, and it, it's driving them to think about their college decision. Some of them may have already decided where they want to attend college, but, uh, but we know that, uh, that at any point in the year, a student could receive one of these postcards and, and maybe, maybe change their mind or maybe help them think twice about this, about their decision. And we hope that it's gonna drive them to choose our community colleges. So the inquiry campaign, once a student gets that postcard and they raise their hand and they say, yes, I'm interested in hearing more, they will get a, a series of up to 10 emails. Every one of those is going to push them to apply for admission to one of our colleges. They also receive the brochure that is in the clear gas, uh, glassine envelope that you, uh, that you received. So once they've inquired to a specific college, they get that, that brochure from, from that college. We also have a survey that's going out to them, getting valuable information about what it is that they're looking for. And then at this point, we've also collected, as a part of their inquiry, we've, we've collected their cell phone numbers. So we have the ability to text them as well. And so text messages are pointing them back to the college's website and back to the application for admission. They're also receiving a phone call. Once they've inquired, uh, we're making sure that every student receives a phone call from a call center um, that we've partnered with, uh, not specifically for this effort, but, uh, but through another effort, we have a call center. And, uh, and so we've sent, we're sending these names to that call center to make sure that every student gets at least a phone call uh, so that we can find out more about them and push them in the right direction. And then access to the personalized landing page where they can find, again, more information about applying for admission, academic programs. And one thing I'll also say about this landing page and some of the emails is that we didn't want to assume that every student to whom we're marketing is interested in attending a four credit program at one of our colleges. There's also information on this landing page and information built in within these emails that lets them know that we also have Skills for Success courses that are available through our, through our Innovation Center. So if a student is not wanting to pursue that avenue of education, maybe they're wanting to pursue a shorter route toward a career, they, they also know at this, at this very early stage about our Skills for Success programs. The emails all have a, have a, a variable banner. So here's samples of the email banners that are going, uh, that are the headers on all of the emails that students receive at the point that they've inquired. Here's a sample of the postcard. Um, it's a, it's a, just a bifold brochure that uh, for this sample, the, guy, the girl at the microphone is the very front of it. And then the QR code uh, with the address information is on the back. Here's another sample of that for Drake State. No, I'm sorry, Chattahoochee Valley. Our goal, and I'm, I'm wrapping up now, our, I know that some of our presidents may have questions about this or the process. We've presented this information to our deans of students and to our enrollment managers and several others, and some of our presidents have sat in on those, uh, on those demos. If you have questions about those, please reach out to myself. Uh, but our goal was very simply to, uh, to drive more students to apply for admission and to ask for more information at our colleges. Once a student applies for admission, they get no more information through this effort. 
it, the college's enrollment marketing efforts take over completely at that point. But this is just an effort to drive more students to the application for admission. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to three, uh, to three incredibly helpful people throughout this process. Ebony Horton and our marketing team worked with our colleges to collect all of the marketing information, uh, all of the logos, all of the colors, all of the, uh, the typefaces. Everything was collected by that office, and, uh, and they, they made that a very easy process for us. Philip Green, who's sitting in the back joining us today, Philip is our Director of Strategic Enrollment Management. He has been leading the charge on this and has just done a fabulous, fabulous job of making sure that, that in our partnership with this company that we are representing our colleges and not necessarily representing the community college system. We are representing our colleges. Um, and then finally, Molly, Par Molly Pollard in our IT division, who helped make sure the data connection was there. She partnered with the company to make sure that that data connection was seamless and making sure that data is, is flowing back and forth so students aren't receiving irrelevant information. Uh, again, we're really excited to be able to partner and do something that not only markets our system, but specifically markets our individual colleges. So um, I'll, I'll take any questions if you have them, but, uh, but that is, that's our presentation. and. Uh, just appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about it. Yes. It, it is a little bit too early. We are, we are a few weeks into this campaign. Um, we know, based off of the number of, uh, we are getting some return mail. Um, so we know that, I mean, postcard, based off the number of return mail that we're not getting, we know that students have got, that thousands upon thousands of students have gotten these postcards. Um, and we have, we've had quite a few students who have inquired. Um, we are still, are still kind of in the stages of trying to make sure that we are mapping the data properly so that we can see at, to, down to an individual student who got the postcard, who inquired, and as a result of that, who applied for admission. So hopefully, hopefully very soon we'll have some of those numbers to be able to report out. Great question. Yeah, this seems like a, a really great program. Um, we heard a little bit earlier about some of the other different agencies and the other groups that are out there. Is that uh, at all in the roadmap to reach out to some of these other groups. I mean, I know this is centered for the high schoolers and the folks that have taken the ACT, but is there any thought or consideration to reach out to some of these other groups? Absolutely, we have we have certain uh, partnerships right now with uh, with companies that are assisting us in uh, in reaching out to non traditional student populations. Um, they are not receiving print information quite like we like we are here, but that's something that we could absolutely build in. Uh, <coughs> even even in partnership with this company, we could build in print uh, to uh, to other populations, uh, particularly non traditional or uh, or workforce education. There are a lot of things that we could do with this, and I think the I think the sky's the limit. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to do that. And, and I believe Russell in his introduction even mentioned something about uh, personalized acceptance letters. We're not doing that through this. That's certainly something that could be on the table. That is something that we could do. But again, as I, as I stated earlier, once a student applies for admission, we are not we are not marketing to that student on behalf of the college anymore. If that's something that our presidents have an appetite for, we could certainly build that in. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Neil, thank you and your team. We, we see the results of, of your work and your team's work in the community college presidents uh, with our enrollment numbers. And while we're seeing the decline nationwide, uh, we're seeing good things here in our own system. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I also would like to, you know, there's a lot of talk going on, a lot of shuffling the deck about workforce, workforce training. We've tasked our staff people to find a way to get to the people. And I think this is a meaningful undertaking. We see the results in enrollment, particularly of college students, but it has already been demonstrated. There's a whole different population that we need to reach. And it won't ever happen unless we have some kind of organized, consistent plan. Talking about it hasn't solved the problem. And I'm, I'm not being negative toward anybody, it's just 
that I think this is the beginning of a major effort as we fine tune it, expand it, and do the kinds of things that we think we can eventually do. I think we can make a difference in the labor participation rate. Thank you, Chancellor. I think that's absolutely where we need to be focusing. Thank you. Anything else on your report? No. Okay, do we have any committee reports? Okay, our uh, next meeting is the work session that will follow this meeting, and we'll, we'll take about a 10-minute break. That'll be this meeting, and then our next board trustees meeting will be May 8th in this room at 10 a.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Got a motion and a second. second. All those in favor, say aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start back in 10 minutes.
Some of those, some of those are samples that they created for us. Yeah. But so, like the one that has my name on it, it's kind of they've already kind of created like an inquiry record, a test record for me. But some of the ones that I gave out are almost, almost a little bit problematic. Like Brock Kelly uh, from LBW said, "Hey, we got one in return, you know, in return mail, and we scanned it, and it went to Enterprise Test." And I said, "Well, here's the problem." Or I said, "It's not necessarily a problem, but..." If it was a student who lives in a, a shared territory, and that's very possible where y'all oh, are, they may have. This one over here, we have uh, Carlisle, Jefferson yep. County. Well, it could be Equality State. Equality yep. right. Jeff State. So, so you got, I mean, they're within 20 minutes. Yeah. So, so what would have happened if, if they were in somebody's service? Oh, yeah. Postcard. Yeah. So if it's a bevel postcard. It means that the student fell into your service area, but then we sent. But then when we sent the postcard, it drove them to that that personal line uh, page where they actually can select absolutely. other colleges. Uh, they said, they can say Wallace State. Option State. number yep. one. Uh, had a pretty big pool. Option uh -huh. number two. Jeff yeah. State, I believe. Yeah. But you can. It, it had a drop yeah. down box. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you, it's not. It is personalized, and you try to. You're trying to direct them. At the end of the day, it's their choice. That's right. Yeah. Down on the right. I think they will yeah. take you. That's right. But it's a win between the college system. And that's, that's what yeah. they're driving for. Well, and that's, that was and also. We, that's why you wonder why we stay yeah. with the fly. Yeah. This stuff. Yeah. And then it's. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, that's right. Because you don't want it. Going out and be interested in Exactly. Exactly. But, but you know what, what could happen is if a student inquired to Jeff State and they applied at Lawson State, they're not getting anything else from us on Lawson State, but they're still getting stuff from Jeff State. Yeah. State. So it could happen. But yeah, those one off things. That's right. It is what it is. That's right. So, but it was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think so. I think we're going to be good. Session. Yes. There's a, a lot of a lot of items on the agenda. Wanting to hold them up. We'll call that work session meeting to order. And <laughs> David, if you'll take over. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the first item on the work session agenda is LBW's request for approval of a lease agreement between the college and the city of Luverne. Uh, for a term of 10 years. The annual lease payment uh, will be $1. Uh, and under the lease, the city of Luburn will use the college's Luburn Center as a base for the city's utility, water, 
uh, and electrical departments along with other governmental services and operations. The college will retain a portion of the building to provide uh, welding training to its K-12 partners uh, and the community uh, at large. The uh, city will pay for the upkeep of the building and all utilities related to the building along with providing security for the entire building. Does anyone have any questions uh, as to this item? We'll move to the next item then, and it is uh, another request by LBW, uh, this time for a naming opportunity uh, with respect to the college's administration building on the uh, Andalusia campus. Uh, the uh, college proposes to name the administration building the Dixon administration building and to add appropriate signage if approved. Uh, this naming opportunity will be in exchange for a gift of $500,000 from the Salon and Martha Dixon Foundation. Any questions relating to this item? I'm going to take the next two items together. Uh, they relate to policy 501.01 uh, and seeking a revision of that policy and to create a new policy 502.01 that will deal specifically with leases. What we are proposing is to take two paragraphs out of the current uh, 500.01 policy uh, that deal with leases and move them to 502.01 uh, with the hope of alleviating any confusion uh, that, there, that might exist with respect to leases uh, the new policy would also increase the chancellor's authority for the approval of leases uh, to a total amount of $500,000, uh, and anything above that would have to come to the board for approval. Uh, does anyone have any questions relating to uh, the revision of 500.01 and the creation of 502.01? The next item uh, is another policy revision, this time policy 610.01, uh, dealing with uh, the accumulation of sick leave. Um, if approved, this policy revision would take effect immediately. The uh, revision, uh, which is found in section 3.3.3, of uh, policy 610.02 uh, reads as follows. For any full-time employee working less than a full load during any semester, sick leave earned will be on a prorated basis. See ACCS Fiscal Procedures Manual. The intent is to make the policy consistent with the Fiscal Procedures Manual. Any questions on this item? The next item uh, is a request from LBW to uh, increase its special building fee from $10 per credit hour to $15 per credit hour uh, and if approved, uh, the increase would take effect in the fall semester 2024. Uh, it is anticipated that the additional revenue to the college, should this be approved, would be approximately $170,000 per year. These funds would be used for the payment of principal and interest on bond debt. Are there any questions relating to this item? <laughs> the next item is a resolution approving, or I should say proposed resolution, approving 
and authorizing the chancellor to complete negotiations and execute final construction contracts and purchases for rural health care projects. The purpose of this resolution is the allocation of $31 million that was uh, appropriated to the Alabama Community College System through uh, <coughs> Alabama Act 2023-378, which was for the purpose of establishing Alabama Centers for Rural Health Care Opportunities across the state. Included with the materials is the Chancellor's Memorandum of March 5, which uh, details the colleges who will receive a grant uh, under this appropriation and the amount of the grant each college will receive. Does anyone have any questions relating to this item? <coughs> the next four items all relate to uh, proposed uh, revenue bond issues. Uh, they are all still in a preliminary stage or under construction, one might say. Uh, we hope to have additional information uh, for you uh, the next time we have the opportunity to speak. Uh, along with additional information as to what uh, specific projects uh, these bond issues will relate to. Uh, but the first uh, is at Calhoun Community College, uh, who was requesting the Board of Trustees to adopt a resolution for the issuance of revenue bonds uh, in the amount of approximately $30 million. Uh, the uh, bond issue of $30 million would carry with it an annual debt service of approximately $1,920,000. I'm sorry, $1,920,000. Any question on Calhoun's bond? The next uh, requested bond issue is at LBW, where the college is requesting uh, approval of a uh, issuance of revenue bonds in the approximate, approximate amount of six million dollars. Uh, that six million six million dollar bond issue over the course of thirty years would uh, carry a annual debt service of $384,000. Any questions on LBW's request? The next request is from Shelton State that the Board of Trustees authorize issuance of revenue bonds in the amount of approximately $18 million and uh, a bond issuance in that amount over a 30-year period will carry an annual debt service of approximately $1,152,000. Finally, we have a request from Trenum State that the Board of Trustees authorize uh, a bond issuance of approximately $6 million and uh, such a uh, bond uh, over a 30-year period would carry a debt service annually of approximately $384,000. Any questions with regard to Trenum's request? The next item is from Northwest Shoals, uh, where the college is requesting <laughs> approval to expend $644,000 $215 for the pur purchase of a mobile simulation vehicle. Uh, these funds would come from the Centers for Rural Health Care Opportunities Grant, which, we, which I mentioned just a few moments ago. 
This uh, vehicle will uh, provide simulation training at rural high schools, long-term care facilities, and hospitals in the college's services area. The uh, vehicle will house two hospital-like rooms for geriatric, standard adult, and pediatric mannequins. Uh, the college will also be in a position to provide additional training in obstetrics and neonatal care using mannequins from the college's nursing program. Are there any questions relating to this item? The remaining items of the work session uh, are all facilities items, and I'll turn the floor over to Mark. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, board members and Chancellor Baker. We have eight items to present to you this morning. The first one starts with Chattahoochee Valley. This is the renovation of the Adams Hall building. This was the acquisition that we made from Troy University back in about 2021. This project is now ready to move forward in terms of renovating and repurposing the space. You can see the, we have improvements slated to take care of the exterior portions of this building and modernizing the, the facility itself and giving it a contemporary look. And then we've included in your packet as well floor plans for the repurposing of the first, second, and the third floor. The first floor here is really targeted as well as the second floor for student services and a one-stop approach for the students at Chattahoochee. And then you go to the third floor and this is really beginning to be built out for other programs for the main office functions that the college has uh, to also help position those and make those available to the students that are in that facility. We do have bids coming back in that we've scheduled for demolition later this month and then we plan to finish up with the finalization of the drawings for construction uh, documents that will go out and we'll take bids in the next couple of months for the renovation of the facility itself. We've included in your packet other additional financial information that gives you those information, the, the budgets and so forth that we had and discussed last week. Any questions about Chattahoochee Valley and the renovation of Adams administration? The next project that we have takes us down to Bishop and to specifically the Carver campus. We've had some monies that were identified here in the last couple of weeks that have a short timeline and expenditure uh, deliverable that takes us where to the end of September. So board members, this particular side of the campus here at Carver is where we have been finishing up the renovations of those spaces with the use of federal funds. Those funds are restricted to the internal use of the building and so the monies that we have available and in this project are gonna go to really modernizing and looking to do the facelift portion of the exterior of these buildings. As that project moves forward, we have Thompson Engineering that's working with us on that, and we anticipate having those bids go out and take those back so that we can bring those to you for action in the June board meeting. We have a short window of about 11 weeks that we'll have to move quickly. This is as fast as we can move, though, considering the short timeline and the notification for these funds. Any questions about the exterior improvements to the Carver campus at Bishop State? The next project that we have is also at Bishop. This is for improvements to the gymnasium located there on the main campus. We have a similar situation with federal funds that have an expiration at the end of February that we are redirecting into the modernization of some of the spaces within the gym. Board members, those spaces are the locker facilities that you see here, the training room, the restrooms, and an additional uh, build out of additional restrooms, and then in here, 
space for the athletic department. As we go through this, you know, we have a demolition plan. We have put out to bid already a demolition bid package. We expect to have that bid package back to us here later this month so that as a board that you can act on it in the May board meeting. We'll get that demolition moving, and then as the demolition is progressing, we will then finalize the specifications for the renovation of these areas, take those bids in at the end of May, and bring those back to you for action in the June board meeting. <coughs> Board members, any questions about this project and the renovations at the gymnasium? The next one takes us to Lawson State. This is for the purpose purchase of four parcels of land that the college has identified up there at the Birmingham campus. We've located here, the campus itself is right here. One of the streets that is just adjacent to the campus has these four parcels that the college is wanting to make those purchases for the benefit and future use of the institution. And we've included in your packet a little bit more detail that speaks to these parcels to give you a bit of a better look at what we're looking to acquire. We did include in there the finances and so forth that were um, expected for the purchases. Any questions about these particular parcels for Lawson State? The next project that we have, board members, takes us over to Marion Military Institute. And the renovation and improvements to Trustees Hall, which is a dormitory facility that they have on campus there. It's located close to the uh, administration area of the campus and in the corner down here where you see essentially the location of this particular dormitory. We included in there another profile or a photo of the building. The, in essence, they're going to take the funds that they have <laughs> legislatively received last year and put those into improvements in that building, some targeted towards HVAC, they also want to look at windows and some other cosmetic improvements as well, such as paint and so forth. Anything else, any questions, board members, that you have about the improvements to Trustees Hall at Marion Military? We begin, board members, we do expect on this particular project, as we look at the schedule, that they'll begin to start moving forward with expenditures as we go into the month of May. The next project takes us up to Wallace Hansville. Located up on that campus, board members, we have two buildings that are receiving HVAC improvements. We have down here this particular building, which is known as Bevel, which is where they have their health programs. And then over here across from the main administration building, we have the dormitory known as Lady Lines Residence Hall. In there, the scope of the work is really targeting the systems that have come to the end of their useful life. And these are, this project is made possible because of the federal funds that are available through CARES and other resources that the college has cobbled together. We do expect to receive bids later this month for this particular project and then moving forward and bringing those to you for action in terms of the equipment and so forth at the next board meeting. Board members, any questions about Wallace Hansville and the improvements, HVAC improvements that they have on campus? The next one takes us back down to, or takes us over to Bevel State. We've had a lot of activity on and efforts with the, uh, the collaborative efforts with Alabama Power. And we're taking the HVAC training center and putting an addition onto that space that will focus on energy services infrastructure type training. And this is going to occur in the Jasper, at Jasper and support that particular campus. In the 
project itself, board members, this is the existing HVAC training center, and this is where the addition is being programmed and scheduled to go. As we go through this particular project, we included a series of renderings that give a really nice perspective uh, to the addition that will complement the facility that is there. It's very techy and aerospace looking. It is a metal uh, butler type building and will be very similar to what we have already existing at that campus that as you walk into the facility, we really have a state of the art <laughs> training center for HVAC. The addition will be that way as well and so we're really taking and dressing up a Butler building to look very, very nice and attractive. Other slides that we included in there that will highlight Bevel State and the energy infra infrastructure training and then also partnering and giving recognition to Alabama Power. We've got the various divisions of work that will go into the space in this particular site plan that you see here. Everything from EV technology to fiber optics to weatherization, those types of things, and also solar energy will be one of the priorities that we have in this particular center. Board members, any questions about the Energy Infrastructure Training Center addition going out at Jasper for Bevel State? Board members, the next one takes us back down south to Bishop State, and this is for a property exchange with the Mobile Housing Authority. As we look at this particular project, there is an effort down there to do some modernization and some revitalization in the downtown area. The four parcels that we have, board members, are located here. And it's just across the street from where President Charles' office is located. As we go into the project, we've given a little bit more detail for you to consider as we take a look at the parcels of land. We have essentially about 1.5 acres in this swath that we are then going to take and move from this location here and exchange up into this area here in exchange for an additional 15 acres. So we'll swap out 1.5 and we'll pick up about 15 acres for the college to benefit in future use for athletic programs and so forth. The land swap is also highlighted with a little bit of information pertaining to future housing. And certainly this is one of the efforts that President Charles has worked on. That is, this development goes forward he'll have the option at this point to have a housing solution for his students. We have a non-binding letter of intent that is being circulated to this particular development group and with escape clauses and so forth that are embedded in it if things do not work out uh, to protect the institution as we move forward with this agreement. We've included the additional slide here that shows those 15 acres in a little, more, little bit more detail. Board members, any questions about the land, stop, land swap exchange between Bishop State and the Mobile Housing Authority? Board members, that concludes all the projects. Thank you. Thank you, Board. Thank you. That concludes all the items for the work session. If there's nothing else, thank you, Chancellor, for you and your staff for helping prepare that. And we're adjourned. My bad.